Okay, let's get started, please. So um, uh, remember what we're talking about. We're talking about something that you've seen before. Uh, you know, infinite series. Infinite right. So we're, we're talking about you know how do you sum uh, an infinite number of numbers, right? And of course, that's that's not something that you actually can do, right? We can't actually sum an infinite number, an, an infinite number of numbers. But what we can look at is the uh, uh, convergence of the partial sum sequence, right? So just to remind everybody, right? You have some, um, you have some sequence, right? And you want to talk about this thing, you know, the, the infinite series, right? The infinite series, as if we were we we're actually summing, you know, an infinite. Uh, summing all these uh, this infinitude of numbers, um, but we actually can't. Uh, but we what we do is we say you know this thing equals some L um, if uh, the uh, partial sum sequence converges to L. Right. We we translate this to a statement about infinite sequences. Right? And infinite sequences, we already have a, we have a full developed theory about. Right? So recall, right, you, let, um, you let S of k be the sum of the a sub n's from n equals 1 to k. Right? And then you consider, so this is the, you call this thing the, S, the S's, um, the partial sum sequence. Right? And like we just said, right, we say that the infinite series converges to L um, if the partial sum, partial sum sequence converges to L. Right? So really, it's a statement about a sequence uh, that's related to, the, related to this infinite series. Okay. Okay. So, and then uh, the first couple of things we did were basically translations of results, so translations of uh, results about series, about sequences. Right? Um, so the first one was this thing, the Cauchy criterion. Cauchy criterion, right? And, you know, if you're, so um, the way you want to think about that is that's basically just a translation of the, um, of, uh, um, so back when we're talking about sequences, and you know our sequences are uh, our sequences of, of, of complex numbers. Okay, so for us, um, you know, convergence sequences of complex numbers, right? These partial sums, these partial. This, this partial sum sequence is a sequence of partial is a sequence of complex numbers, right? So this converges um, uh, converges if and only if the sequence is Cauchy, right? If and only if the sequence is Cauchy, right? Because the because the complex numbers are complete, right? So the first result we had um, is basically a translation of this, right? To say that S of n is Cauchy gives us is the same thing as saying if you translate that that's a statement about that's a statement that we call the Cauchy criterion. Okay, so um, uh, this thing converges. Um, you know, this thing is going to converge if and only if. Um, so this, if we translate this to a statement about about series, it says that this thing converges. Uh, if and only if, um, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an, uh, an n such that if n and m exceed n, then the size of the tail from n to m uh, of the case case is smaller than epsilon. Right? I, hope that's, I hope that's clear that that's exactly the same statement, right? For this thing to be Cauchy means that the partial sums are close to each other, right? 
for the partial sums to be close to each other means that their difference is small, right? But the partial sums are sums like from something to m and something to n. So when you take their difference, you're going to get this this fraction, this you know, portion of the tail. Okay. So for the for this thing to be Cauchy means that the partial sums are close to each other. That it means exactly this: that the that the fraction these you know you know, amputated portions of the tail are, are small. Okay. Okay. And then we had this other, we had another statement. So that was our first, first, uh, first result about, about series. Um, so translations of results about se sequences to the setting of series. Okay. And then the second one was this um, statement about non-negative series. Right, that um, that a non-negative series converges if and only if the partial sum sequence is bounded. Right, and what that was was just a um, the analog of the monotonic sequence theorem. Right, you took the monotonic sequence theorem and you said, okay, if you have a monotonic sequence, well, I'll hold on for a second. Right. What did the monotonic sequence theorem say? It said that if your sequence is monotonic, then it converges if and only if it's bounded. Right. Well, if you've got a non-negative series, then your partial sum sequence is monotonic. Right. Because you're always adding on, you know, say, positive terms. Right. So that's going to converge if and only if it's bounded. Okay. So, right. So we've got these two results. First is the analog of 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 just saying that the sequence is Cauchy, and the second is, is uh, the analog of the monotonic sequence theorem. Okay. So that's, that's where we started, that's where we stopped. Okay, so let's go on. Um, yeah. Unless there are, there are questions. Any questions? Okay. Okay, so um, okay, so uh, the Cauchy criterion, so consequences of the Cauchy criterion, mainly. Basically, we're going to start with the Cauchy criterion and then get some results and then get some more results that, that build on top of that and go just keep on following following off each other. This is a really well constructed section in in this book. Okay, so. Um, the first is the following, the comparison test. Okay, does anybody remember the comparison test from, from whenever you saw it? Vaguely, no? It's okay, it's all right. It's probably, you probably saw it when you were, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I have no idea what it's not. Okay, so um, let me just put up some notation first. We're going we're gonna to have three sequences involved. So let me just put them down first. So we've got these three sequences, A, C, and D. Okay, and um, uh, the comparison test has two sort of forms. They're equivalent, uh, basically equivalent. So if... Um, Suppose we know that the, uh, that the magnitude of a sub n is controlled by c sub n for all n. Okay. For all n, really, we don't need it for all n. We need it only past some point, right? Because, you know, you don't care what happens in the finite. You would care what happens in the infinite, right? So suppose that you have something like this, you know, and the a sub n are, are the sizes of the a sub n are controlled by, by the c sub n. Past, past some point in time. Okay. Then, uh, then, if the C sub n converges, we have that the A sub n converge. The the, the series, the, the sum of the, if the sum of the C sub n converges, then the sum of the A sub n converge. Okay. So this is your comparison test, right? If, and notice that the C sub n are assumed to be real, right? If you see something like this less than or equal to the c sub n, 
you can conclude, you, you know that these guys are real, because otherwise it just, this doesn't make sense. Okay, so the C sub n's are real numbers in this, in this setting. And, and the A sub n's are, could be complex numbers. They don't have to be real. So you notice, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, actually you see that the C sub n are non-negative, non-negative real numbers from, from this fact here. Right? Okay. So, um, so, so I, uh, okay, let me put the second part down. The second part is that, um, Suppose that the a sub n are all bigger than, the d sub n are all bigger than zero, for all n bigger than past some point. Okay, so again, here you see that the a sub n and d sub n are, are real numbers, okay, because we've, we, we're talking about the order here. Um, then, if the smaller guy diverges, if the sum of the smaller guys diverges, then the uh, larger, some of the larger guys must also diverge. Okay. But you see that, that that follows from the first part. Right? That's just a consequence of the first part, right? Because you know, if, if the A sub n converged, then the D sub n would have to converge also. Right? So if the sum of the bigger guys converged, then by the first part, the sum of the smaller, some of the d sub n's would converge also, right? So that that second part is just a consequence of the first. So we don't have to worry about it. Okay. Is that all right? Okay. Okay. So let's prove. Uh, let's prove the first part. I just erased what I need. I don't know if, if, if you've seen this story in the videos, but I, I had a professor in undergraduate who was so masterful. He would come in, see what the last, last lecturer had left on the board, and then he would selectively erase parts of it. He would leave a graph here, some words here, and then he would start lecturing from the left side of the board. As he progressed across the board, he would work in the previous material into his lecture and uh, just keep on going. <laughs> And we would always cheer when he did it, because it was so amazing. Yeah, well, I can't even do that with my own writing. Um, OK, yeah, this was uh, Professor Gunning. Uh, uh, always happy, happy guy. OK, um, okay so let's, let's do the first part. So you know, if the bigger guy converges, then the smaller guy, the, you know, the guy whose, whose norms are controlled, must also converge. Okay. So, right, so let's think, right, by the Cauchy criterion, right, we want to show that, right, what do we want to show? We want to show that given any epsilon, there exists an n such that if you're past that n, you know that the sum of the a sub k's from k from n to m, let's say that n, let's say that n is bigger than n, um, that the size of this thing is smaller than epsilon. Right? That's that's what we that's what we need to do to show that that this that this, this smaller, smaller series converges, right? Okay, so why is that, uh, right? But we, but we know that we can do such a thing for the C's, right? We know that we can do such a thing for the C's, and so what, what do I need to say, right? So we know, we know that there exists an N for the C's such that past that point, we have um, uh, the sum of the C sub K's from K equals N to M is smaller than epsilon, right? So why does that give it to us? Why can we just, we can just use that same N because, because of what? I need to say one thing.
right? I have control over this. I want control over this. I want the same control over this guy, right? Well, the sum of these guys, right, what do we know? We know that the magnitude of each of, of the summons, each of them is, is you know, controlled, each of the summons is controlled, right? Summoned by summoned, right? Term by term, we have this control, right? So, um, uh, so uh, in that case, uh, summation of the ace of k from k equals n to m is going to be less than or equal to it's going to be less than or equal to what am I going to say? I need to say uh, one thing, which is triangle inequality. Right? By the triangle inequality, I can bound, I can control the size of the norm by the sum, sum the magnitude of the sum by the sum of the magnitudes, right? And I know that that's smaller than or equal to by the cease of things, right? My assumption, right? I guess I have to assume that I'm past this n, so I need a different n. We know there's an n prime, right? So I need to, I guess to work this in, sorry, I, sh I should have said, um, we can assume Assume, take the larger of n and, and n prime. Okay, so this this n over here and this n prime. Okay, so then pass that for for m and n bigger than the larger, bigger than the larger of the two. We're gonna have this. Right. Right? Which is smaller than smaller than that. Right. I don't need the absolute values here because this is a sum of positive of non-negative terms. So okay. Okay, so that gives me the uh, that gives me the comparison test. That that I hope you all remember now. Okay, so any any questions about that? Yes, Brooke. So you just know that the it's the sum of non negatives because they're greater than the absolute value of the area? Yeah, yeah, right? Because the absolute value the you know, whether this is the absolute value or the complex absolute value, you know, either way, those are those are non negative numbers. Gotcha. Right. So you know that, that these guys are all, yeah. Other questions? Okay. Yeah, that's just implicit in that in inequality. Okay, let's go on to the next one, which, so that, that, that one you may have seen, but the next one I'm pretty sure you have not seen. I almost guarantee, guarantee it. So this is the theorem of Cauchy's. And I'm going to call it the uh, Lacanary theorem. I don't know if it's actually called this, but it makes sense to call it the Lacanary theorem. What does lacuna mean? Anybody know this term? No? It just means gap. There's a gap. So there's a theorem about summing a series with, by, uh, with gaps. I guess none of you have to memorize like obscure vocabulary uh, for the SATs anymore. <laughs> when I was young, you know, when I took the SAT, we had to memorize pages and pages of obscure, obscure vocabulary. So like, in, in calculus, you may have seen osculating circles. Have you seen this term? Osculating circles. So who, who knows what osculate means? It means hmm? No, it's, it's actually very different. <laughs> it means to kiss, actually. So it's, it's when you have a curve, and then you have a circle that, that is, just touches it at one point. So the circle osculates, it's osculating. <laughs> that, that was actually something that we had to memorize. Okay. In any case, um, 
we have this Lacanary theorem of, of Cauchy's, so it goes like this. Um, suppose you have a non-negative, non-increasing sequence. So when you have some sequence, non-negative, non-increasing. Non okay. um, then its corresponding infinite series converges if and only if um, this series converges. Let me write this as sum of n from 1 to infinity. So this is saying that we don't have to know, we actually don't need to know all of the values of this, of this, of this sequence. We only have to know you know, a, sort of a very sparse subset of them, right? We look at the, you know, the first term, the second, the fourth, the eighth, the sixteenth, and so on and so forth. Okay, and we multiply those by the corresponding uh, uh, coefficient, right? And, and, That'll be enough to, uh, if that thing converges, then the original converges and vice versa. Right. You can sort of see what that, I mean, you can, this is, this is actually pretty obvious. Right? You can see from the picture, right, like, if, if you know, like, if you know the first, the second, the fourth, right, the eighth terms, right, right, that's, you know that the sequence is decreasing, right? So that basically, you know, specifies the sequence well enough. You know, it's, this sequence is, is, that gives you enough information about the sequence that, that you can tell whether, whether it converges or not, right? That's, that's basically the idea, right? That, okay. um, let's, uh, let's put out the details here. Okay, and to prove it, we're going to use the convergence theorem. I'm sorry, the comparison test. Okay, so some notation. Let S of n denote um, the, sum, the partial sum, partial sum of the of the a, a, sub, a sub k's. Okay, let T sub k denote the kth partial sum of the of the second series. Okay, so these are these are just the partial sum sequences. Okay, and what we're going to show is that they're they're comparable to each other. So that one is going to be larger than the other, that they each is larger than the other, basically. Okay. Yes. Is this an a case term or a two case? Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's going to be a two. So now we make some observations. Okay, so observe. Suppose that um, suppose that n is less than two to the k. Okay. Um, then I claim that s of n is less than or equal to t p sub k. Okay. So this is pretty pretty obvious. You say, well, look. S of n is a1 plus, plus a sub n, right? Uh, I said S of n equals this, but that's less than or equal to a1 plus a sub n plus a sub 2 to the k. Let me go a bit farther, plus a sub 2 to the k, plus a sub 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. Okay, so we go up to the uh, a to the 2, we, we, we stop right before the, to the, the 2 to the k plus 1th term. Okay? Okay. Um, now these guys are decreasing, so what we're going to do is just pair them up. We're going, to pair, we're going to put them in groups, basically. We'll say, 
Okay, I'm not gonna actually, I'm not gonna include you. Instead of you, I'm gonna include two of, this, two of the first guy in your group, right? I'm not gonna, so I, I, I'm only gonna, I'm gonna only look at these guys, you know, at the, uh, at the powers of two, uh, in, where, the, where the index is some power of two, right? Everybody else, I'm gonna replace by the first person in your group, right? And that will just make it bigger because everybody after you is smaller. Right? So you say, okay, I'm going to say this is going to be a1. I'm going to have 2a2 plus 2 squared, a2 squared plus, and so on and so forth. Right? Up to the 2k guy. So 2 to the k, a sub 2 to the k. Right? It's only going to get bigger because right, I've just replaced these guys with, with, with the first guy in the group who is the biggest. But that is, of course, um, T sub K, right? So that tells me that the T sub K is, uh, that I can get, you know, T sub K is bigger than the S of N's, right? And so that tells me that if the, um, if the uh, SN are unbounded, then the T sub K's are unbounded. Right? In other words, if, the, uh, if this guy diverges, then that guy must also diverge. Okay. We're dealing with non-negative sequences, so uh, non-negative series, so all we need to think about is boundedness. Okay, so any, any questions about that? We just basically just group, group them, right? the first guy, and then the next two, the next four, the next eight, and so on and so forth. Right? And then we replace each group by, by the appropriate number times the first, um, times the first element. Okay. And then we do something similar for the opposite. Um, so, Right. Um, right. Similarly, if we're going in the opposite direction, um, um, we observe that that um, if n is bigger than two to the k, then s of n is greater than a half of t sub k. We do this in exactly the same way, right? We say, okay, let's look at S of n. That's going to be the sum of a1 through a sub n, right? a sub n is uh, n is bigger than two to the k, so we can throw out some terms, right? We throw out some terms to get down to you know, summation, uh, just just down to the first two k two k terms. Right? Um, and then we group them again. We say, okay, this is, we're going to group them similarly. This is A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus A4 plus, plus A2 K minus 1 plus 1 up to A2 K. Right? Um, I replace this a1 by half of a1. I keep a2 as is, and then I replace everybody this time by. Um, uh, I'm gonna. I want to make it smaller now, right? I want to make it smaller now, so I'm gonna replace everybody by. Um, I'm only replace the initial guys by the last guy now. Okay. So now I've got two a4 plus. Um, plus 2 to the k minus 1 times the last guy, a sub 2k. Right, and you see that that's, that's just one half of t to the sub 2k. Okay, so nothing, nothing too fancy.
And this is this is more like yeah. this is a nice trick, but it's not it's not particularly not particularly deep. Okay. okay. But it is quite it is quite useful. Um, we'll, we'll use this to get a bunch of uh, elementary results. Um, any any questions? Everybody okay? Okay, okay. So um, here's some some increasingly complicated examples. Yeah, I hope you all recovered from the last lecture, which was you know horrifically boring. <laughs> I went I went home and just like in depression. <laughs> Anyway, okay. So, um, uh, so first example has nothing to do with, with anything that we've done so far, but it, we should we should include it anyway. Um, you, and you've definitely seen this geometric series, right? So, um, examples of non-negative series. So, um, so uh, here it is, right? For x in zero one, uh, the half open interval is zero one. Summation x to the n equals one over one minus x. And then just we sum from zero to infinity, we get one over one minus x. Right? And who wants to tell the proof of it? Anybody? Not maybe it's not exciting. Does anybody like to tell this proof of it? Right, why does the geometric series uh, sum to and, and of course notice that um, if x is bigger than one, then you diverge. So why does this converge to one over one minus x? So you consider the partial sum series. I, I, I don't know if, if, if you all know it and just don't want to say it, or, or you don't know it, or what. How many of you know the proof? OK, OK, I take it back. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> OK, forget it. What am I doing? OK, why, why? OK, sorry, my apologies. Um, gosh. OK. OK, OK, so great, great, great. Then I have something kind of cute to show you. <laughs> I think you'll like it. Um, so you look at the partial sum series. You say, okay, I'm going to sum the powers of x from k equals one to n, uh, k equals zero to n. Okay, right. Well, that's going to be one plus x plus x to the n, right? And then what you do is you consider x times that. Right, x times that is going to be x plus x to the n plus x to the n plus one. Right, and then you subtract. So uh, one minus x plus the n is going to be one minus x to the n plus one. Right, you take this minus this, and you get this, right? Of course, this minus this is going to be 1 minus this last term here, right? Then you divide s of n equals 1 minus x to the n plus 1, and you get 1 minus x in the bottom, right? So that's the partial sum, and if x is smaller than 1, then you know that the limit of this is going to be 1 over 1 minus x, right? Because this term is going to vanish.
Just out of curiosity, how, how many of you have seen that before? Some of you, yeah. Good. I'm always trying to push stuff, on, stuff onto my daughter, who is 14. Um, I think she's reached her breaking point. <laughs> um, yeah, she's, I don't think I can teach her any more math. <laughs> Not that I've taught her a lot of math, but it's enough. Um, So, so geometric series, okay, next one we're going to talk about is the P-series P test. Okay. There, are, there are different ways to prove this, but um, probably the way you did this was by using like integration or something like that in, 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 in calculus. And we're not, we're not, we don't, at this point we don't know what an integral is. So at least we haven't introduced it, so it wouldn't make sense to, to talk about it at this point. So we're going to, instead, we're going to use Cauchy's Lacanary test. Okay, so this converges if and only if um, P is bigger than 1. Okay. Right, so summation 1 over n, right, the harmonic series does, does not converge. Right, or you know, 1 over n to some numbers some number smaller than one, those guys even much more so do not converge. Right? Okay, so um, so first off, um, let's assume that p is p is bigger than zero because otherwise you have divergence. Right? I'll leave that to you to, to check if you want, if you feel like it. So check. So we're going to assume that, that P is, is positive. And then, so we've got this, we, what we have is non-negative, non-increasing se se series, right? Se sequence, right? So we're going to apply the Lacanary test. So let's apply the Lacanary test. Okay. The Lacanary test says um, that this thing is going to converge and only if the uh, 2 to the k over 2 to the k p, uh, right, k equals 0 to infinity, converges. Right? But let me rewrite that. That's the same thing as summation 2 to the 1 minus p k times k. Right? So just you know, use your properties of, of exponents. Right? But this is a geometric series. Right? This is a geometric series. Right? This is this to the k to the kth power summation from, from k equals zero to infinity. So we just apply the geometric series thing to this thing. Right? We know that this is going to converge um, if and only if uh, 1 minus p is less than 0. Right? Because we want this thing to be smaller than 1. We need this thing to be smaller than, smaller than 1. So we need one minus to be one minus to be smaller than zero. In other words, we need p to be bigger than one. Okay. So that's 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 that. Okay. okay. So just you know, straightforward application of Lacanary test. Right. Lacanary test says we don't look at this thing, but we would rather look at you know the the you know just selected selected uh, terms but multiplied by the appropriate coefficient. Right? And that turns into this geometric series, and we apply the geometric series test. Okay. okay, 
so that's good. So that says that um, you know if you if you look at this thing summation one over over n to the p, right? As long as p is is you know some tiny number bigger than one, then you have convergence, right? So one point zero 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 one, then you have convergence, right? But if you're at one, then you diverge. Okay. So the next result is related to that. It's sort of like uh, checking the boundary of, of convergence. So if you look at 1 over n, but right, so we know that we know that this diverges, right? We know that this converges, right? Okay. So if we put in some sort of slow growing function here, right, this is a very this is a pretty slow uh, you know uh, function, right? It's growing you know, fairly slowly, but it's fa that's fast enough to make it make it converge. Okay. So now we're gonna sort of mess around with that edge. And we say, well, what happens if we put in log? Right? What's the slowest function you know? Well log is is you know probably it. So let's, what, what happens if you put in a log there? Does this converge or does this diverge? Right? Is the log, right? The log is slower than any power, any power of n. Right? So what if we put that in? Is it still going to convert? Will it, will it converge or will it diverge? It's not really clear. Right? Okay. And so we have the following result. Yeah, the following result that this uh, converges if and only if p is bigger than 1. Okay. So in particular, if p equals 1, then it actually diverges. Okay. If it, p is 1, it actually diverges. Okay. So that's kind of cool. Um, right, uh, Plain old log is still uh, till still too st still too slow to make this thing converge. Okay, so um, proof is again apply the Lacanier thing, right? So the Lacanier theorem says that we need to look at summation two of the k, um, and then take these guys at the two of k points, okay. we need to uh, consider, we need to consider this thing, right? Of course, the two of the k's cancel off, right? And we end up with, um, you know, the, 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 k, the k pulls out, right? We get summation one over k to the p uh, log two to the p as k goes from k goes from uh, 1 to infinity. Sorry, 2 to infinity. Right, because we're, I'm oh, sorry, one, 1 to infinity. OK. Uh, OK, but then what we get is 1 over log 2 to the p times summation 1 over k to the p, right? And so we're done, right? That, that, that converge, converges if and only if the power is, is bigger than 1, right? That was the, that was the, the p series that we just did, right? That's this. Right? This converges if and only if p is bigger than 1, right? So, so we're done. Okay, so that's pretty nice when right? you get this sort of, you know, it's just sort of an example of sort of like, you know, more and more intricate uh, uh, examples, more and more intricate examples of, of convergence using the Lacanary test and kind of building on, building on previous tests. Right? So maybe, you know, there should be another example that uses, uses this to get an even more complicated result. Everybody, any questions? Any questions?
Okay. So, um, okay. So, uh, there's a little, there's, I'm going to ask you to read, there's a section in the book that I'm going to skip. It's, it's on E. It just talks about the number E. Please read that yourself. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about now are things that you've seen before, but definitely not in this form. The root and ratio tests. I know you've seen them before, but in the context of limits, and this time we're going to do it using lim soups. And the reason for that is so that you can do uh, complex and complex analysis. For those of you who are enjoying this teacher, <laughs> I will probably be teaching complex analysis in a year. So not next semester, but the semester after. Um, so I know if you if you want to see me again, that's, that's that, that'd be nice. But <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, complex analysis is one of my favorite courses to teach. So uh, yeah, although I haven't taught it in a while, I haven't taught it in a long while. So but but um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a very cool course where. Uh, everything kind of everything works out beautifully. That's that's what's that's what's kind of wonderful about complex analysis. It has all these uh, sort of amazing results, um, and they work out um, kind of nicely. Um, uh, when I was um, when I was a sophomore, and deciding whether or not to be a math major, um, I decided okay, I'm going to take you know two. Uh, two upper division math courses and see if I can handle it. And if I can handle it, then I'll be a math major. Um, so I took complex analysis and then uh, what's referred to here as graduate real analysis, um, like 137. Um, and somebody said, oh, you're stepping in the shallow waters and the deep waters simultaneously. So um, what I mean to say by this is that complex analysis is still kind of in the shallow waters. It's, it's fun, you can splash around, you don't have to worry about drowning. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was my, my, my professor who made this comment, like, oh, you're going to the shallow and the deep waters. Yeah. yeah, and I survived, and I became a fashion teacher. Okay. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I was going to be an English major. <laughs> Okay, uh, so the root test. Um, okay, so you've probably seen this before. Maybe I should stop saying that. But given a uh, an infinite series, um, what you do is you let uh, alpha be the limb soup. Now you haven't seen this before. You let alpha be the limb soup of the nth root of the um, of the nth term, of the absolute value of the nth term. Okay. Okay. So you consider the 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 absolute values of each of the of the of each of the terms. You take their nth roots and you look at that sequence and you say, okay, what's what's the limb soup of that sequence? Okay. And it turns out that if if this alpha is less than one, then then it turns out that the sequence converges, the series converges. Um, if alpha is greater than 1, then the series diverges. And that's all you know. If alpha equals 1, actually you don't have any information. Okay. It could, be, could converge or it could diverge. Okay. Um, so if you look at, for example, summation 1 over n, right, then the root test would give you a 1. And if you look at summation 1 over n squared, then the root test also gives you a 1. Okay, Because you're going to take the nth root of, of this, you're going to take the nth root of, of this of this thing as n goes to infinity. That will also be 1. So 
the root test can't distinguish between these two, these two uh, series, but this one diverges and this one converges, right? So, so that's, that's why alpha being one doesn't, doesn't tell you anything. Okay. Right. The root test is kind of blind to, 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 that, to that difference. Okay, so okay, so here's the idea, right? Um, here's the idea. Before we get to the proof, let me let me give the idea. So suppose we had the following. Suppose we knew that the nth root of the nth term actually equaled uh, equal alpha. Okay. Right, the limb soup is 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 alpha. The limb soup, limb soup of this is alpha. Let's suppose that the limit the limit is actually alpha. No, let's suppose that it actually not that the limit is alpha, but this thing equals alpha. Right, because basically that's what's going to happen. Right, in the limit it's going to get arbitrarily close to alpha. Let's pretend that it actually is alpha. Okay, right. But if that were the case, then you would know that um, this thing would be alpha to the n. Right? Just take n, the nth power of both sides. Right? But um, in that case, you know that summation alpha would be summation, I'm sorry, summation a sub n would be summation alpha to the n. Right? And so you've got a you've got a geometric, you've got a geometric series. Right? And if this thing, if this number is, is smaller than one, then you've got convergence, and if it's greater than one, then you have divergence, right? Okay, so you know, that's that's the idea that you know you, you think okay this is you know, basically going to be something like a geometric series. Okay. Okay. So let's let's that's that's the idea. Now let's use the limit to to get that. Okay. So we don't have equality, but having the limb soup is, is enough. Okay, so let's let's consider the case alpha is less than one. Okay. Okay. If alpha is less than one, then uh, choose a beta such that um, beta is between alpha and one. Okay. So here's one. Here's alpha. Here's zero, and we choose some beta between alpha and one. Okay. Now we're going to use the limb soup property, right? The limb soup property is that if you choose anything bigger than the limb soup, you can make things smaller than that guy, right? That's the, the sort of half limit, half limit property of the limb soup, right? Choosing anything bigger, right? It's basically adding any alpha, adding any epsilon. You can find a time past which you're under that under that bar, right? So adding an epsilon small enough that we're still smaller than one, you know. Let's, let's do that. So um, we know that uh, uh, alpha is the limb soup of this thing. So um, we know that there exists a time such that this, this, the, the, the thing you're taking the limb soup of is smaller than alpha for everything past that time. Right, um, but you see what that gives you. That gives you that um, the magnitude of, of, uh, of alpha, uh, a sub n is smaller than beta beta to the n for all n bigger than n. Okay. okay. Now, by the geometric series, right? Since summation beta n converges. We have um, uh, uh, we're done by the comparison test. Right. Our comparison test said that as long as the size of, of one guy was smaller than the other guy, and the bigger guy converged, then then the sum of these guys was going to converge. Right. So we're done by the comparison test.
Okay. Um, now the other half, suppose alpha is bigger than one, right? In other words, that the limb soup, right, the limb soup of this thing is bigger than one. But that means that, um, uh, so we know there exists a subsequence. There exists, exists a subsequence A sub n sub k such that the nth root of, sorry, the kth root, uh, sorry, the n sub kth root of A sub n sub k um, converges to alpha. Right? That's just because this is the limb soup. Right? It's the, it's the, it, it is it's, it's, it is itself a subsequential limb. Okay. So that's just the definition of the limb soup. Um, but this this alpha is bigger than one. Right. So that tells you that um, uh, some sorry absolute value of a sub n sub k is bigger than one for all k. Uh, bigger than some large k. Okay. We know that these guys converge to something bigger than one. Well, then they've got to be themselves bigger than one past past some point. Okay. But then that tells you that um, uh, that the a sub n's are bigger than one for infinitely many. Many n. Right. Uh, that contradicts the divergence test. Remember, if we had that divergence test, it said that convergence forces the size of the terms to go to zero, but we've got infinitely many terms that are bigger than one. So we, we cannot converge. So we diverge. Everybody all right? So notice that you know if you were back in calculus uh, and talking about limits, of course the same proof is going to go through, right? Because if the limit, right, if the limit were alpha, then you know that you know you can find some beta between he between here and here that works, right? And then you just do exactly the same, the same, exactly the same proof. I'm sorry, you would just, you would do exactly the same thing, you'd say, you know, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, that, that's not, you, you, you would choose your beta, you would choose your beta as before, and then go, the, the same proof would hold. Okay, uh, okay, I'm going to erase this side, if that's okay. Okay, the second, second thing is the, the ratio test. So again, um, kind of a similar thing. Um, uh, the series summation A sub n converges if the limb soup of the um, ratio of terms is less than one and diverges if um, the ratio of terms is greater than or equal to one for and bigger than some fixed n. Okay, so it's a little bit less cleanly worded 
than the, uh, than the root test. Okay, okay. So the proof is kind of similar, kind of similar to the last one. Um, So, you know, again, the idea is again, the idea is, right, suppose you have equality, right, suppose you have, um, uh, say that this thing equals some alpha, and that alpha is less than one, right? What's going to happen then? Well, a sub n plus 1 um, is going to be equal to alpha times the size of a sub n. Right? So every time you progress, you multiply by some power of alpha. Right? So again, this, this turns into um, some, some constant, it would turn into some, some constant times the uh, geometric series. Right? And then the geometric series is going to converge if your, if your, alpha, if your ratio is smaller than 1. So it seems like it's basically the same same thing. It's not exactly. Um, okay. So um, so uh, so um, so proof proof is similar. Proof is similar. Right, you just use the uh, the proof of part one is 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 basically the same sort of proof. You're going, to choose a, you're going to choose a beta that is, that is between alpha and 1, and then you say, OK, well, then this is going to be smaller than beta times that, and you just do exactly the same thing. Okay. So you don't need to prove that again. Um, right. Do we need to do that again? Should we do it again? No. Yes. Does anybody, anybody want to do it again? That's fine. No? Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's basically the same thing. So, um, uh, part two. Um, uh, the problem with this part two, uh, I mean, the reason part two works is you say, well, look, um, if this sort of thing happened, Right, you know, past some, past some n, then you see that, like before, the a sub n don't go to zero, right? Because the size, the size is increasing, right? So it's not going to go to zero, and so you get divergence. Let me just make one, one, one remark that, that's, that's in the book. Um, so Rudin gives this example. He says, look at, here's, here's this kind of interesting, here's an illustrative example. If you look at the infinite series that goes a half plus a third plus a half squared plus a third squared plus right, uh, a half cubed plus a third cubed, and so on and so forth, um, then uh, if you apply the, the root test to it, um, if you apply the root test to it, then you actually get 1 over the square root of 2. If you apply the, um, if you apply the uh, ratio test to it, then you get um, uh, then it turns out that you get um, uh, the limit of three halves to the end, which is which is infinite. Okay. So in, in this example, the the root test tells you that it converges, and then the um, uh, 
the, uh, the ratio test doesn't, doesn't tell you, right? The ratio test sort of doesn't, doesn't give you any information about it. So, even, so the, the point here is that even though they both seem to be based on the geometric series, they actually have different, uh, different potencies, right? Different, different uh, they, they, they have different application, they have different applications. So um, let me finish off, I think, with um, uh, uh, something we're going to get to. Um, I'm not sure how, I, I think we're actually not going to get too, too much into this, but this is something really crucial. Um, and you're going to see it a lot. If you, if you take a course in complex analysis, you're going to see it a lot. These things called power series. So um, the setting is this. You have a bunch of complex numbers. Okay. You have a bunch of complex numbers, um, and you have uh, a complex variable. In complex analysis, one uses um, you know, W and Z and zeta. Uh, as the variables rather than x and y. Um, um, so you have a complex variable, and you consider um, a series of the form summation uh, c sub n z to the n from n equals 0 to infinity. So a series of this form is called a power series. about this is that it's a function, it's a function on the complex plane, right? It's this function on a complex plane, right? Your z is some variable point on the plane, right? And you plug it in, you, you plug that z into this, into this thing and you get some value out of it. You know, if it converges, it may not converge. Okay, so this is, you know, this is, this is basically a function, right? This is some, some function of a, comp, of a complex variable. Um, okay. So um, now here's the kind of cool, cool thing called the uh, uh, the disk of convergence. So um, uh, let c sub n z to the n be a power series. Let, uh, let alpha denote um, the limb soup of the uh, nth root of the absolute value of the nth term. As n group, uh, yeah. OK. Um, and let, uh, and let uh, r be 1 over alpha. OK. Um, and just by convention, uh, if alpha is zero, we let r be infinity. If alpha is infinite, infinity, then we let uh, r be zero. Right? Just so that you know to to deal with those those uh, uh, limit limit examples, limit cases. Okay. Okay. So um, then, uh, then the power series converges uh, in the disk z less than r, magnitude less than r, and diverges outside of it. So this is this is cool. Right? It says that 
if you have any power series, if you have any power series, then there's going to be this sort of radius of convergence. Right? So this R is called the radius of convergence. And uh, you know, this thing is called the disk disk of convergence. Okay. So this is something that that you saw. Something you you know you, you may have seen something like this in uh, in calculus, where you're going to have some sort of you know uh, interval of convergence. Right, and so this is basically, this is saying that you know, in complex, complex analysis, what you have is that you know that there's going to be some radius, and your your power series is going to converge inside that open disk and outside the closed disk, and then on the boundary you don't know. Okay, you, you have to look, you have to do that more carefully yourself. Um, okay, and. So what's what's the proof of this? Just use the root test. Okay, what does the root test say? The root test says that this thing converges uh, where um, if we look at the limb soup of the nth root of the nth term uh, is smaller than one, right? And it diverges where that thing is bigger than one, right? But you see what's going to happen there, right? This, that the limb soup of the nth term of, of that Right, the, um, it's just going to be uh, the limit of the nth root of, of this thing times uh, the absolute value of z. Right? In other words, that's my alpha times z. Right? That's alpha times z. So as long as, so as long as uh, this thing is uh, smaller than one over alpha, we have convergence. Right? And as long as this thing is bigger than one over alpha, we have divergence. Right? So one over alpha is the R. Right? That's R. Okay. So that that just follows instantly from from the from the limbs from the root test with the limb soup. In case you were wondering why that why that worked out in calculus. Okay, and as you expect, right? If you take if you, if you we're, we can also talk about power series centered at some different point, right? And then there's going to be a uh, you know a, a radius of convergence around that thing, right? Um, uh, if I may sort of foreshadow something that happens in, in complex analysis, um, sometimes there's a, there's a point that you have where the series diverges. Okay, so what you can do is take the expansion around some point where it converges, and you get a radius that works here, right? And then you go like this, you create what's called an analytic continuation. So you can you can stretch the initial domain of your function around by taking power series expansions, right? But the odd thing, or the really interesting thing, is that when you come back, sometimes the function that you get when you come back is not the same as the original function. Okay. Um, and uh, so in that case, the natural domain of your function is not the plane, but rather uh, a two-sheeted a uh, two-sheeted complex plane. Okay, where you think of you think of as you cross through this as you cross through 
you, you, you think of the complex plane with a cut through it, what's called a branch cut, so that you've got two copies of the complex plane. As you pass through the branch cut, you end up here, and here's where your second function is defined. Right? And if you reverse, if you go through it, get backwards, you end up back in your original, original uh, with, the, with the original definition of your function. Um, this idea uh, was the heart of, was the, was the idea behind Alice through the looking glass, or its later descendant, the matrix. Right? Um, so uh, uh, Lewis Carroll was a mathematician. He thought, okay, well, let's, let's take this idea. This, we have this thing that you pass through, and you, open, you end up in this completely different world, and to get back to it, you have to pass through the, the looking glass again. So, anyway, so that's, that's it. <laughs> okay, see you guys next time.